said, my name is Sarah Bailey Roberts. I'm really pleased to be here today. First, I wanna thank Fayetteville Public Libraries, especially Amy for, um, for helping me host this series. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And second, I wanna thank you all for being here and learning with me today. So um, just a little bit more about myself and how I got into German Russian history. Um, I just moved here from Lincoln, Nebraska this year. Um, so I was living in Lincoln, Nebraska for six years. Um, I got my master's of library and information um, in while I was in Lincoln. And my first library job uh, was the research librarian at the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia. Um, I still work there doing part-time work, working on special projects, working with really cool texts and resources with a really great group of people. So I've not only worked with a lot of texts, which has been a phenomenal, phenomenal experience, um, and, and not even working with it, but learning German, Russian history and genealogy that way, but I've also learned it through just getting to know the very engaged and thriving community of German Russian people that still exist today. Um, so my uh, presentation is titled Step by Step, and we're going to be highlighting German Russian history and immigration today. And I really think this presentation will serve as a good foundation um, as we as we jump into German Russian genealogy and resources, it'll help us understand what types of records are even available as you see these people move from country to country. So keep in mind throughout this presentation, focus on how immigration was such an important part of the German Russian history from one step region to the other when they lived in Germany and Russia, when they immigrated to the United States, the Homestead Act, when they went to Canada, Brazil, Argentina, these people really were a people of movement and opportunity. So this photo that you see here is of a step ecosystem, S-T-E-P-P-E. -E. Um, so what is a step ecosystem if you've never heard of it? Um, maybe you've been in one before and you haven't ever known it before, but it is a dry, high elevation pr prairie or a grassland. And here in the United States, you can find a steppe ecosystem in eastern Colorado in far western Nebraska. Um, and this kind of ecosystem made up the land where Germans settled in Russia and here in the United States or in the Plain Provinces in Canada. So if you've ever been to the Great Plains, if you haven't, you should go because it's lovely. But this photo here, it looks like the Great Plains. You have the rolling hills, you have the short grass prairie, um, and you have the big sky. But this photo is not a US or um, any North American Great Plains. This is a Russian steppe ecosystem, specifically a, a village called Rothamel. Um, so, we have this, this German or this Russian step here, and then we have a, a Nebraska photo on your right of a Nebraska step region. And the German Russians really found the prairies and the rolling hills of North America similar to that of their home in Russia. And I think this really attracted them to the area when they moved here. If you think about it, the agriculture, the economic experiences, the climate in Russia really prepared them for a successful life when they moved to this area. So who are the Germans from Russia? And I think the name can be really puzzling, especially if you have never heard of them before. So to put it very simply, they were Germans who moved to Russia, lived there for around 200 years, and then immigrated out of Russia to North and South America, as well as a few other places. And on the screen here, you'll see um, various German Russian families. You can kind of see their traditional garb. You can see um, some of the, what the women are doing and the families. And these are actual photos taken from the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, which has a fabulous photo archive. So our story really starts with Catherine the Great. Um, she's also Princess Sophia, but we know her as Catherine the Great. She started reigning in 1762 in Russia. She was a German princess 
Uh, she became Empress of Russia in 1762 by marrying Peter III, who was Peter the Great's grand grandson. Um, she married him, probably already know this history, but she married him, she quickly organized a coup, she overthrew her husband, and boom, she's in charge of Russia now. It was that easy, right? Um, so she successfully overthrew him. And under Catherine's reign, she really wanted to revitalize Russia. She wanted to grow the economy. And part of the way she wanted to do this was issue a manifesto inviting migration to Russia, specifically the lower Volga region in Russia. And we'll show you a map a little bit later on. And her hopes were really to bring progress and industry to this Russian frontier. Um, so her first manifesto that Catherine wrote um, was written in 1762, and it invited foreigners to come settle in Russia, and it really yielded few results, uh, mostly because it was too general, not really specific in what benefits um, she was offering. So in 1763, take two, Catherine writes this new manifesto offering more benefits and privileges, again, aiming to turn the lower Volga region into this productive farmland, not this like wild land that Russia saw it as. We know that there were nomadic cultures living in this wild land. Um, many of them were displaced as the new settlements came in. Many of them had lived in this land since 1500. I feel like we need to definitely point those out, but there were communities there before. Um, Catherine just didn't want them there. Um, so if you don't read old German script or German, if you do, you can read this to yourself. But for those who don't read old German script, um, let me just tell you a little bit about what the manifesto promised. Um, free land, freedom of religion, free from taxation, local self-government, freedom to settle anywhere in Russia, freedom to practice any trade. You did not have to serve in the Russian military. And most importantly, that these benefits and privileges could be passed on to the Germans' descendants, that it was going to last forever. This is key to remember. Catherine said this could last forever. And she was extremely successful with this manifesto. Um, she sent Russian representatives out to recruit. Um, it attracted the attention of not only Germans, but the French. Swedish, some of, some others um, were interested in, in coming and settling. And in fact, many of those who were attracted to the Volga region were Germans who were um, from like South Germany, Southwest Germany, had already immigrated to Denmark. So these Germans had immigrated to Denmark by invitation of the Danish king who created like an agricultural reform act. But they realized when they went to Denmark, this is just a big swamp. We don't actually want to live in Denmark. So then they immigrated again to Russia to this lower Volga region. So what prompted them to come other than that some were living in a swamp um, and take advantage of the manifesto? Well, the Seven Years' War had just ended and the Germans really felt a great impact on war on their families and their country and their communities um, mixed with economic hardships. Um, it really, this promise of the manifesto, especially that they didn't have to serve in the Russian military was really an attractive um, you know, feature of moving. But you know, it has to be said that each family had their own reason of moving and we're not gonna know all the reasons, but these are just some of the, probably some of the factors that helped influence those decisions. So those that did came over, often came over with large families. This photo here is actually kind of of a small family. It wasn't uncommon for German Russians to have 10 kids. Um, many of them were skilled as blacksmiths, shoemakers, doctors, lawyers, clerks, some farmers, definitely. Um, but the Germans really soon discovered when they arrived in Russia that while the manifesto said they could settle anywhere in Russia, they could practice any trade, really what Catherine meant was you have to settle in the lower Volga region and you need to be a farmer. So a lot of those trades that they were practicing, um, they didn't apply. So you can imagine a doctor who was all of a sudden forced into being a farmer wouldn't have really any experience in agriculture or farmer. That was extremely challenging, extremely overwhelming. 
So the first wave of immigrants um, came between the years 1764, um, 1772, and it's estimated around 30,000 people, Germans, uh, came to the lower Volga region. About 100 of these little German settlements popped up uh, around the lower Volga area. Um, just kind of a quick recap of how they got there is they took about nine days. Sometimes it took a little bit longer to go through the Baltic Sea um, they, to get to St. Petersburg, but they stopped at a city um, called the Iranian Bomb where they took an oath of allegiance to the Russian crown. They were given some supplies. It's even said that Catherine herself would sometimes come out on the balcony and welcome the Germans in her own native, their own native language because after all, she was a German princess. Um, and these colonists who arrived at this city were recorded. Um, a list was compiled, and this was a, this is a fabulous resource um, that we'll talk about next week when we get into what types of resources are available for genealogy. So um, the Lower Volga region, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the Lower Volga region is this area here. Um, we have Saratov, which is a city close to the Lower Volga region. These are the routes that they would have taken to get to the Lower Volga region. St. Petersburg up around here. Um, Baltic Sea. Um, again, this is the kind of points of origin, migration routes and areas of settlement. We'll talk a little bit more about this region, which is the Black Sea region a little bit further. But here, this is the Vol lower Volga region that Catherine initially said, hey, I want to settle here. Um, how can we do this? So they stayed um, at the Iranian bomb for several weeks, sometimes several months before making their long trip down to the Volga region. And it was long, it was over wagon train, it was over winter, um, kind of think in your mind, it's very similar to those wagon trains crossing the American West. Um, Catherine did pay Russian families to host some of these German families who were traveling south housing them, feeding them. So they had a little bit of help, but you can imagine, um, you know, they get to Russia and they think they can go anywhere and do anything, but they actually have to take this huge trip down south across a steppe region, across the prairie and plains. So when they arrived along the Volga, I'm sure it was really quite beautiful. I mean, you have this hydrite steppe ecosystem, you have these grassy slopes towards the Volga River. Um, here's some photos here of the Volga River near Samara. Um, but this is a prairie and building houses and any other structures is impossible because there is no lumber here. So it provided very difficult without lumber. So they had to build sod houses, really improvising, figuring out the land because it was really foreign, uh, foreign to them. Um, they had to wait for lumber to be shipped down the Volga River from Surata or St. Petersburg to to begin building their settlements. Um, and I, I want to point out too, when you think of these German settlements, um, maybe you think of like quaint small towns with a couple of buildings, but these villages grew in population to 40,000, um, like Norka and Huck, for instance, in the Volga were really large thriving communities. Um, here's just an example of one of the communities after they of course have, have built it over time. And there was a lot going on, you know, it really was, um, even though it was kind of out in the middle of nowhere, it really was hustle and bustle. Um, so once, you know, they were provided with the tools necessary, they created a thriving region. The German Russians created a thriving region in the Volga. Um, they built barns, they built houses, they built stores, and importantly, they built their churches, um, which were always centrally located in each of the villages. Um, the German Russian people were of all faiths. Um, religion was extremely important to them, not only because they were very, very devout in faith, but because their settlement locations were determined by their religious affiliation. So you would have all Catholic villages, you would have all Mennonite villages, um, all Protestant villages. So they really were building their communities um, and tying them together by, by their faith in, in, in what they believed. And kind of keep, you know, we'll, we'll look at more pictures of churches later, but this type of architecture 
um, is, is from their homeland, you know, they replicate a lot of that as they move to Russia. So you'll see steeples and columns in other churches they build as, as we look at photos down the line in the presentation. Um, so the German Russian people didn't really assimilate to Russian culture. Um, they thrived in their German communities. They practiced their own customs. They ate their own food, um, you know, kind of had their own way of life. Schools and churches were instructed in German, native German languages. They maintained these customs really throughout their entire time that they were living in, in Russia. Um, and, you know, soon after they kind of got settled in their areas, they started farming, which is what Catherine wanted them to do, right? They want, she wanted them to go make progress, make industry, start farming. So they began to farm the, the Volga region. And I think people are always kind of surprised when I say that they use camel as their livestock. You know, this was a high dry ecosystem. I think when you think of Russia, maybe you think of Siberia, you think of cold and forested, but this was further south. It was a little more arid. They had camels as their livestock, using them to pick orchards and their fruit, sitting on top of them like this gentleman is doing now, going along, picking their fruits. They use them as transportation to pull wagons. There are many accounts, primary source documents, which I find quite funny, saying that the camels were grumpy and mean and they spat on you all the time. So they're extremely strong, extremely reliable creatures, but they had a horrible disposition. And this is well documented, um, definitely. So they also farmed wheat, um, which was one of the primary crops of the German Russian farms. See in this picture, men, women, children, they all helped. It was a family affair. Certainly the men just weren't out in the fields doing work by themselves. They also farmed rye, uh, grain, millet, hemp. Um, you know, they were, they, they truly were um, making Catherine proud. So in the Volgren region specifically, these farms were located outside the settlement wall. So the German Russians would live in their settlements and travel outside to their farms during the day, coming back inside their farms at night. Um, this does differ than the Black Sea Germans who were living on their farms. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So moving forward in time, Catherine's great grandson, we have Alexander first, he started reigning in 1801. He further expanded the boundaries of Russia, um, reissuing that original manifesto that his grandmother created and inviting more Germans to come. And it must be said though, that that prior to Alexander, there was a continuous kind of influx of Germans coming into this region. Um, you had the Mennonites were immigrating into West from West Prussia. You have um, Poland giving land to Russia, creating Bohemia. So there were Germans continuous coming in, continuously coming in, but because of the reissuing of the manifesto, because of, of new area um, being obtained by Russia around the Black Sea region, um, it, there was a greater burst in immigration. Um, so around 3,000 families immigrated to the Black Sea region between the years 1803 and 1810. And this is the same uh, migration route that we saw before, um, but instead we have the Black Sea region here. So this is modern day Ukraine. Um, and we have Odessa here, just kind of for a reference. And all these kind of red dots are areas that the German Russians settled. And you can see here, they took many different paths um, to get here. And I'll kind of linger on that. Over here, we have like Lübeck over here. It's kind of around where Bremen is just to kind of, again, orient yourself on this map. So after immigration to the Black Sea, German immigrants um, and their families grew and peaked to around 2 million total Germans living in the Russian empire, owning almost 24 million acres of land. So they came in and they started buying land from the Russians very quickly. Um, this, for example, is a Black Sea village uh, called Alexander Hill. And you can maybe kind of see here that the house and the barn are under one singular roof. Um, again, this kind of differs from the Volga because the Black Sea farms are actually on the, or the Black Sea houses are actually on the actual farms themselves. Um, they didn't have to travel outside the city. 
Um, and similar to the Volga, um, wheat was a primary crop and specifically a turkey red wheat. So this was a type of wheat farmed by the Black Sea Mennonites. Um, it was not only important to their life in Russia, but as we see these Germans immigrating to the US, this type of wheat was really well suited to grow in Kansas and became a really important part of the Kansas economy. And we'll get to that in a little bit later. Um, so unfortunately, the good times did not last long. We have Alexander II here. Um, he took power in 1855. And in 1871, Alexander says, Catherine the Great issued this manifesto. It was great while it lasted. But when she said it would last forever, I, I think what she really meant was it only lasts 100 years. So your time's up. Um, so he's in power now. He just rescinded all those privileges, all those benefits that all those Germans had. Now they were subject to, to serve in the military. They had to subscribe to Russian Orthodox. Russian Orthodoxy, and they had to assimilate to Russian culture. So rather than face Russification, the German Russians really began a mass immigration out of Russia at this point. So immigration really was further fueled by the um, murder of Tsar Nicholas II. I think all of us probably know the story of Anastasia and Rasputin. Anastasia was, was Nicholas's daughter, um, catalyzing the Bolshevik Revolution when the Russian Empire fell, and then further fueled by World War I. There was just a lot of political unrest growing. And it must be said now that those German Russians that did not have the opportunity to exit Russia at this time were banished, they were exiled, they were killed, they were subject to a famine that claimed many lives up to like I think a third of the Volga Germans died um, in a famine that happened in the 20s. It gained attention by the US um, who provided aid in the form of the Volga Relief Society. And the Germans were really discriminated against despite having called Russia home for 200 years. And it was all because they were Germans and they were practicing their very, um, you know, very old German customs in the Russian empire. And that was really why. So they're immigrating out, right? And um, we have a couple different areas that they're immigrating to. So I'll kind of go through them all, starting with the Homestead Act, which was going on at the same time really as the immigration out of Russia. Um, so when the Homestead Act reached Russia, a few men from various villages met, um, they sent delegates to go to America to scope out the land, see what it was all about. They came back to Russia and said, yeah, let's move, let's move. Um, so resulting in first several hundred German Russians immigrating to the United States during the 1870s. This is one of my very favorite advertisements of Kansas by one of the railroads saying it is the best in the US, basically saying it is a tropical prairie woodland adventure. Everyone should go. Um, so this is the type of advertising they were getting um, as they were trying to determine, do they want to go to the Americas um, to, to resettle, to get out of Russia? Um, in Canada in 1880, the, the Volga Germans were settling on the Prairie Provinces. This would be Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Um, even some Germans who had originally, German Russians who had originally gone to the United States then immigrated to Canada because they heard that the US might get involved in World War I. So it's kind of like a double um, migration. In Argentina, which is one of the places a lot of um, Germans went to, the president signed um, an Immigration and Colonization Act that provided a lot of support to Europeans who wanted to come into Argentina. And a lot of Volga Germans took advantage of this opportunity like they did in America. They sent delegates to Argentina to scope it out. Um, primarily Catholic villages went to Argentina and Brazil, but um, there are several instances I've read that Argentina just had better farmland, so more, there's like a higher density of German Russians in Argentina than there was in Brazil. Um, some German Russians went back to Germany, and again, those who didn't leave, those who couldn't leave were exiled or killed. And I think a lot of German Russians who left didn't realize that this migration was permanent. 
I think some of them thought they would go back to Russia, they would be reunited with their family that they left behind. But in a lot of cases, um, that just that just wasn't what happened at all. So immigration often meant males would go first, they would scope out, um, find work in a home, they would act as a sponsor for their family to come over, um, you know, providing that solid foundation for their family once they arrived. Um, and most of the time German families would be placed in steerage, just a little bit cheaper, um, where the cargo was stored during immigration. And specifically regarding immigration to North and South America, it's not super well documented why the Germans, German Russians decided to go to Argentina. Um, it could have been that the, the sea voyage was a cheaper fare. I've read in several inst instances that there were less rigorous medical controls along the border. So maybe if you had like an infection or you're a little sick, um, the US wouldn't take you, but maybe um, Argentina or Brazil would allow you through the borders. Or maybe it was more favorable um, environment for different religious groups, say if you're Catholic. So in the United States specifically, I'm kind of going to focus on the US since that's where we're living, um, that the German Russians primarily settled in the Great Plains region. They definitely settled other places, but I think primarily Great Plains region, not too much in the south where we are, um, but perhaps some of you are certainly from the Great Plains um, and German Russians yourself. So right here in the red box, we have these Great Plains regions, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, parts of Texas, um, parts of Wyoming, Colorado. And in total, around 300,000 German Russians immigrated to the US during the first and second wave of immigrations. And this was around up until like the 1920s or so, um, with most of them settling in North Dakota. So we have this map here, the prairies of North America or the US, I should say. Um, and it it pinpoints different towns that are favorable um, as German Russians settled. Um, and as we go further south, um, there are less German Russians in these, in these states. So North Dakota originally received around 23,000 German Russians, South Dakota 10, Nebraska 9, uh, Kansas and Colorado 8 or so. Um, the 1920 census would be probably one of the first censuses that include the first and second generation German Russians. And you'll see a pattern kind of again as German Russians settled in the US, a pattern similar to that of when they settled in Russia, um, kind of like a lot of Black Sea Germans settled in North and South Dakota. Um, a lot of um, Mennonites settled. In, in Kansas, a lot of Volga Germans settled around like the Lincoln, Nebraska area. And we'll get into this a little more next week, but um, it's worth mentioning here. So Volga Germans really had been prepared for life on the steppe, as we mentioned. And this Homestead Act in particular differed from their life in Russia and that the Homestead Act really required Volga Germans in specific um, to live on their land instead of living in these very tight, close-knit communities that they were used to. Um, and you can imagine how isolating. And this really isn't specific to the, the German Russians. We know that the Homestead Act was a very isolating experience having lived on, you know, you have to live on these vast acres of land. Um, but what they did do similar is that they did remain somewhat isolated from the rest of you know, the other residents, they continue to preserve their language, they continue to preserve their traditions for decades, and they really didn't assimilate into American culture until many decades down the road. Um, you know, they continue to buy up a lot of farmland, just like they did in Russia, they passed it along to their children, they built houses, large families were living in this house, houses, not uncommon to find, you know, children and their parents and their grandparents and maybe some aunts and uncles and cousins living in one house just finding any place that they could to sleep um and again we'll dive into this a little bit more next week as we get into the censuses so within the walls of the house you would find you know baptismal certificates uh confirmation certificates uh, again just a testament to how religion was is so important to the German Russian people, it's not just a Sunday activity, it's really an integral part of their life and the community that they are creating for themselves. Um, 
churches and houses were patterned after those in the homeland in Russia, which were patterned after the homeland in Germany. Um, you can see here the churches have a very similar architectural style. The bottom church is one of the churches in Balzer, Russia, and the top church is a church in Lincoln, Nebraska that is still standing today. They look very similar. They have the tall steeples, they have the columns, um, kind of these white washed wooden churches. Um, and, you know, you saw on the map earlier, I want to point out um, Ellis County, which is in Kansas. As you're driving through the short grass prairie, there are still these cathedrals on the plains, as they call them. You can see the steeples rise over the short grass prairie as you're driving. And it's, it's, it's stunning because they really are these big, beautiful cathedrals that they put a lot of time and effort and money into to, because it was so important to them and their community. So for employment in the U.S., German Russians worked in these sugar beet fields um, in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, in northern Colorado, around the Greeley area. And the Volga German immigrants were extremely instrumental in the development of um, growing the sugar beet industry. Um, the Great Western Sugar Beet Company, um, the American Sugar Beet Company often paid for passage on like the different railroads like Union Pacific or the Burlington to take German Russians out west to work on the fields. Um, they would take whole families out west to work in the fields. Um, during farming season, they would have to live in tents or shacks. If they're lucky, they could sleep in one bedroom rooms all while working on the field. Um, the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia has a ton of the Great Western Sugar Beet Company photos that are just fantastic. We see, um, you know, a man here with his child, um, and they're just really striking images of, of people working in this industry. So a little um, statistics for you is that many started off as working as sugar beet workers. Um, so in the 1920s, we have 50% of Germans were working as workers, you know, topping the beads, working long hard hours in the fields. Ten years later, 1930, 15% were workers, and a full 85% were owning and farming their own fields. They rose to the top very quickly. Again, very similar to how they're rising in the top of Russia. They're extremely hard worker. They know how to work the prairie. Um, they know how to work hard. And plus, they've been immigrating country to country, trying to figure out how to live. Um, and with that becomes just really great worth ethics and kind of powering through hard times. And again, this is one of my favorite photos because it shows a mountain of beets behind some hardworking men. And these beets often would weigh 10 pounds. Um, they were not small. They, it was a really hard job. And believe it or not, children often would work in the beet fields. Totally not uncommon. This photo here, you see kids as young as like four or five in these photos. Um, they would leave for the beet fields um, before school ended, return after school would start, often had to repeat grades for it. There is many, there have been many papers published about child labor in the early days of beet farming. Um, you know, this really demanded long hours, um, low wage, backbreaking work for men and women and the children who were all involved. So, um, unlike most other farmers in the Great Plains, we've said this before, German Russians were already well experienced at prairie style agriculture after living in Russia. Um, wheat farming, was a main source of income, particularly in Kansas when Mennonites brought that turkey red wheat over that I was talking about. Um, and again, turkey red wheat was so well adapted to grow in the Great Plains that it became so important to the Kansas economy up until like the 1940s. So this is very recent. Um, aside from working um, in, in agriculture, we had a lot of men working on the railroads, um, the Union Pacific Railroad, the Kansas Pacific, um, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Um, it was another popular job, and there were a lot of perks that came with this. This was a pretty enticing job. Um, it offered free housing. It offered free sleeping cars out west. Um, they granted land for schools and churches, the railroads did. They supplied some farmers with seeds. So, you know, they worked there and they got something in return, um, certainly. 
So while German Russians are not working in the fields doing backbreaking work, um, they certainly know how to have a good time. Um, Dutch hop dance is one of um, a very favorite of a lot of German Russians. Um, it was music that they brought to the United States, a part of their culture and tradition um, in, you know, weekly, avid in houses and dance halls. They still take place to this day. I've been to Dutch hop dances. They're a hoot. Um, they, they consist of accordions and keyboards and definitely the hammer dulcimer. Um, and, and they're a lot of fun. They were a constant source of entertainment for sure. And of course, like a lot of, you know, I can do this presentation without talking about food, which of course is very popular too. Um, so we have here some photos of, um, in the top right here, we have Virox or um, Runza. So if anybody has ever been to the Midwest, you have maybe seen a Runza. I think Amy is nodding her head. Maybe she has seen one. Um, so these are kind of stuffed bread rolls of cabbage and ground beef and onions. Um, these are homemade runzas here, but Runza, the restaurant, um, trademarked, is a fast food restaurant. So these were German Russian. These were originally German Russian runzas. Um, you also have Kuchen, which is a really popular dish, but there's a little war between the Black Sea and the Volga Germans of what Kuchen is the real Kuchen. Um, Volga Germans have the coffee cake Kuchen. Black Sea Germans have the custard Kuchen. It was up to me. They're both extremely delicious, so I think everybody <laughs> wins this game. Um, you also find Rebel, which is fried dough or Bellina, which are pancakes. I just learned while doing this presentation that many traditional German Russian foods or um, recipes don't list tomatoes because tomatoes are an ingredient that hadn't really been adapted into their food ways when they were living in Russia. So I thought that was kind of interesting to share. Um, so as I said, the German Russians were a people of movement. They traveled from country to country, carrying on their hard work and their ethics, their customs, their cultures. Um, but their story isn't over by any means. The community of the German Russians is alive. They are still working on preserving their heritage, with sharing it with, with future generations, with their children and their grandchildren. Um, the third part of this series is really going to be focusing more on those communities that are trying to preserve um, the German Russian history, how to get involved in those communities, um, how they're discovering and, and disseminating German Russian information. Um, there are many places doing this and they're all definitely worth a look into if you want to, you know, continue expanding your knowledge about the German Russian people. So here are just some additional um, reading resources that I thought I would add here. And I'm just going to put a pause on it. So if you want to write them down, you can. Um, I think these all of them do a really good job at covering the history of the German Russians. Of course, I only have 30, 40 minutes to do that. I certainly have left some things out, but these are really good texts to kind of help fill in the gaps, give a little bit more information. From Catherine to Khrushchev is an extremely popular book. It is the one I read when I first got started into learning about Germans from Russia. Did a really good job at creating a good foundation for me. Um, the Stars German, I have a particular liking for that because Patty Plum Williams, she was a student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She did her thesis and dissertation on German Russians in the Lincoln, Nebraska area. She graduated with a PhD in 1917, a woman graduating with a PhD in 1917, um, and did a local census of Lincoln, Nebraska um, um, German Russians. And she wrote this book that was based off of her thesis and dissertation. And just a few more books. Uh, these are more geared towards U.S. settlements. Um, there's certainly more on, on other North and South America ones, but since we're kind of focusing on the U.S. right now, um, this is more about the Black Sea Germans and then pretty interesting book by Richard Salad about the German Russian settlements in the U.S. <laughs> So um, it's kind of in my presentation. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope you learned something new and I'm happy to um, take any questions. You can put them in the chat box if you have any. Well, that was fantastic. Um, so, so interesting um, for many reasons, but one, 
in particular, my husband took a trip over to the Ukraine and he was talking about how he didn't realize it was uh, a wheat belt just like the Kansas area. Um, so mind blown that it was actually brought over from here, <laughs> you know, a lot of it was brought over from, from that area. Um, yeah. Very, what very, a cool trip. <laughs> yeah. And then the hand pies, uh, had we were one of those families that just like stop at random places, world's largest ball of twine, blah, blah, blah. Um, we saw the world's largest check egg. <laughs> and, and they were having some was that in festival. Nebraska? I'm assuming. No, this was actually in Kansas. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and to Colorado, and uh, yeah, they, we had one of those hand pies, uh, not a runza, but what you called it, uh, the beer ox. Mm -hmm. The beer ox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're wonderful. delicious. They're great. <laughs> so um, Annie said, did some German Russians settle in Eastern Washington under the Homestead Act? They did. Um, I think around the Pasco region. Um, I know I have a few people on here that probably would know better than me. Some of my bosses actually are on here right now. Um, but um, yeah, so we were actually supposed to have a convention in Eastern Washington a couple years ago. Gosh, it was 2019, I think it was, but it got canceled because of you know what. And um, that was try to kind of reconvene, you know, all the German Russians that are still in that area. Um, and kind of get them together. Our conventions are annually, and basically, you know, we get a lot of German Russians together. We actually take our library to each convention that we do and like set up a makeshift research room. So one of them was actually going to be in, um, in Eastern Washington to um, kind of rally all the German Russians that were in that area and get them together and get them talking and, and kind of, you know, have a fun time. So yeah, definitely. They also settled in Texas around New Braunfels and but other Germans, areas. Germans down there. That's what we're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, so many different places. So again, certainly not just the Great Plains. That was kind of like a concentrated area very um, that they were at. So okay, and we also have conquering the is it wind? Oh, the wind. The, mm -hmm. the wind is a good starter book. To, oh, okay, excellent. Yeah. How about the, yeah, I have that somewhere, actually. Um, and Nancy says, I came from the Prairie County in Illinois. Many uh, Germans came from 1860 to 1870s from Baden, Mecklen Mecklenburg. They took farms over and also opened bakeries and small groceries, grocery stores in very small farm towns. They later took in Germans and, from Russia. I assume they were helping relatives. Uh, what brought them to U.S. in 1860s and 1870s? Hmm, that's a good question. That's pretty early, um, early migration for the German Russians because it was kind of before, you know, that, like the, the Russification of them. Um, again, probably many different reasons. I don't have one specific for, you know, that I can answer right now, but. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, I can certainly look into that for you and kind of like talk to you a little bit more about the area that they were in. I would love to do that. So, okay. And Deborah says, well done. My heritage is Prussia and I grew up in the central oh. South Dakota area. I enjoyed traveling all over the area and eating at the local German restaurants. NDSU has a good department and I am, and I, my relatives belong to a group in the trip South Dakota area. Oh, awesome. NDSU does have a great department, and I'll be talking about that in the third week. They have the GRHS and GRHC. It's amazing. Um, they do also an annual conference each year, and yeah, they, I worked with, I've, I have worked with them very closely in the past. Um, they're all so nice and so knowledgeable over in that area, so they're great. So I'm guessing you, we have some German Russians in the audience, then, which is very exciting. I was hoping that would be the case. Uh, Danita says many Germans from Russia and Wyoming, Central Valley of California and Oregon. I could see Wyoming. That looks a lot like the step country yes. you just showed. Yeah, def yeah, Cal yes, a lot in California, definitely. Yeah. Were the programs that pushed the German Russians out as violent as those experienced by German Jews? Did Russia military do the massacres or did they incite? civilians to fight the Germans? Yeah, um, it was pretty horrific. I mean, there, um, 
there are several publications that HSGR, the American Historical Society of Journalists Russia, um, HSGR, um, has published that are memoirs from a lot of people who either have firsthand or secondhand accounts of what went on as they were kind of forcibly removed from their homes. And it's pretty grim. I mean, they, a lot of them, they had to dig their own graves. They would have to be stand in front of the graves they dug and then they would be shot. Um, you know, during the famine, they were having to peel bark off the tree and boil it to eat it because there was nothing else to eat. They would have to be sent to gulags in Kazakhstan, um, which a lot of those gulags in Kazakhstan actually weren't shut down until later, until after like the, the concentration camps were shut down. So, I mean, they were, it, it was, I mean, the German Russian history we say is kind of a grim one. You know, they were really um, discriminated against and they were forcibly removed from their lands multiple times. And, um, you know, there were mass deportations in the forties because of Stalin. So he just kicked them right out. Their villages were destroyed, completely wiped out. Um, it's, um, it's, it's truly amazing to me that the records that we have and ca are continuing to, um, to gather exist because I cannot believe they survived because they, right. I mean, they, you know, they just tried to eliminate them completely. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I don't, I don't want to compare, compare, but it, it's, you know, just that discrimination across the board. It was, it was just horrible. You know, it was, um, I know a lot of the German Russians when they came to the U S or immigrated out of Russia would not talk about their life in Russia. It was, I think it was too painful for them, really. So um, some, you know, of the children or grandchildren of those, you know, first generation, you know, U.S. citizens, um, maybe they didn't know the German language because their parents didn't teach it to them, or maybe they didn't know some customs because their parents just didn't pass it down. So yeah, I think it was, it was pretty painful. <gasps> letters from hell. I see Kevin there holding up letters from hell. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. Um, so we have this famine that's going on in the 20s, um, and the Volga Germans are suffering terribly. As I said, they're peeling bark off a tree and boiling it and eating it. Um, and, you know, in the 20s, we have these Volga Germans, and they were, um, some of them had family in the state, so they were corresponding back and forth. People in the U.S. were messaging their families in the Volga, along the Volga River, and saying, hey, what do you need? And these people are saying, we need money, send it. Well, you know, they could send money, but, you know, Russia is opening all the envelopes and taking out all the money before it even gets to the, to, um, to the families who need it. And um, there are these letters that were written back and back and forth between families. We call them the letters from hell. And it, they are letters that are documenting what these people are going through. Um, HSGR, I'll do a little plug here. HSGR just published the first volume of the Letters from Hell. Um, it's incredibly sad, but it's also incredibly interesting. Um, and, and this is my actually favorite part of German Russian history is the famine are these letters because though they are painful to read, they are so real and you get to know these people on such an intimate level because they are burying their soul through these letters and just trying to reach out for help as best as possible. Um, and the people writing this, these letters are just, you know, anyone from the community. I mean, it's just, um, you know, they're just sending them in and then try to get more um, people to know what's happening along the Volga River. These letters were published in newspapers to get a broader awareness of what was going on. So it wasn't just the families reading these letters, like the communities who maybe had no relations to the Germans from Russia were reading these letters and saying, wait, what's going on over there? Um, you know, that prompted um, the Volga Relief Society, which sent, sent aid um, to help the, the Volga Germans, so. And also a good insight into into history, like the we, exactly what what they're living through um, on yeah. a very personal level. Very yes. Um, so in answer to Nancy, um, Deborah says her great 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 grandparents immigrated because of the turmoil happening in Prussia. Um, yes, it's very grim, but like you said, hard workers. I can mm -hmm. understand why stoicism is associated with the German from Russia. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Danita, uh, they were also deported to Siberia and Kazakhstan. Many Germans were able to leave Russia and were and where they were deported to and moved to Germany, Canada, etc. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy, who wrote or published Letters from Hell, if we want to find and read this book? Yep. Um, so it was published by the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia. Okay. And um, it's, you know, it's a, you know, kind of epistolary. It's a, a, it's of letters written by various people, but they were transcribed and edited by HSGR, that organization, mm -hmm. and kind of bound together. I think they're doing like several volumes and the volumes are based off of like a year span. So maybe volume one is like a certain year span. Um, and yes, Dodie just said you can go to HSGR.org to purchase. And um, oh. they... There will be more coming soon, but this one is just volume one, and it's, um, like I said, it's it's really it's very interesting. So, okay. And uh, last, Danina says, um, August twenty eighth, nineteen forty one. The German families were deported from their villages. Uh, many died or starved to death and were forced into labor camps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So very grim. It's it's a sad story, but a little bit of redemption, a little bit of hope that a lot of were able to get out. Um, we're able to find homes elsewhere and, you know, here we are talking about them and, you know, that's, that's exciting. That's good news. So yeah, live on. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Again, Sarah, thank you so much. And also to those of you who uh, came to the program, there are two more. You do have to register individually. Sorry about that. Uh, but we will keep you posted with um, any handouts or anything um, going forward with that. So again, thank you very much. This was fantastic and uh, can't wait to have you back. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Bye, Amy. Thank you. You bet. Wow, that was fantastic.